Thank you, Sabina. Now, the Asteroid Day itself takes place on June the 30th every year. And it's absolutely no accident why this date was chosen. It does, in fact, have a very special place in the history of studies of asteroids. And if I can ask you, Mark, tell us a little bit about that history and the importance of June the 30th. Okay, well, let's rewind to when I first uh, learned about Asteroid Day, and it was in September of 2014, three years ago, and uh, yeah, three years ago, and I met Greg Richter, the filmmaker, um, and he had premiered his film 51 Degrees North. And afterwards we had a discussion and he told me about this idea he had cooked up called Asteroid Day. And it seemed very exciting to me. And I said, hey, you should have it on June 30th. And he said, we already thought of that. That's when we're gonna. So, <laughs> so it was the obvious date. And the reason it's obvious is because it's the anniversary of the largest impact in human history, the largest observed impact. It was, it was the Tunguska event on June 30th, 1908 in, in Siberia over a very remote place, but it was widely observed by people. Wasn't really recognized for, for what it was at the time because it was so remote. Could have been a comet, was probably an asteroid, but it was an enormous explosion. Mm, give us a little feel for yeah. um, what actually happened that day. So, so it, it came screaming into the atmosphere. Now, we don't know exactly how fast it was going because we didn't have dash cams at the time. <laughs> um, so we only had eyewitness um, observations, uh, very bright light in the sky that streaked over Siberia, and a, an enormous explosion um, that shocked, injured some people, killed reindeer, um, and knocked over trees over an area spanning 2,000 square kilometers and actually lit fires from just from the thermal radiation because it got so hot. Um, and I had the opportunity to do physics modeling of that event to try to really understand the physics of, of, of what happened, how exactly did it explode, and what was the mechanism for blowing over the trees. It turns out that it generated a very strong blast wave, a shock wave in the air and very high winds, beyond hurricane force winds, that blew the trees out into a radial pattern. And interestingly, directly beneath the explosion, it didn't blow the trees down, but it stripped all the branches off the trees. The trees remained standing and the, and the Russians called them telegraph poles. Mm -hmm. So this is um, a particularly important day in the history of asteroid research and um, the absolute perfect day um, on which to hold Asteroid Day. Now, rather like you, um, I first met Greg as a filmmaker uh, when he was working on his 51 Degrees North film. And then, uh, yes, I got this telephone call saying, I think this would be a great idea. What do you think? Shall we, shall we, shall we do it? I said, well, how do, you even, how do you even start to do something like that? Uh, and uh, he said, well, I've got an idea. And it was, uh, I think it was the day after he called me back. He said, um, Brian May's on board he's going to help found this. And at which point um, the whole thing began taking on um, a life of its own. And Danica, I believe it was Brian May who introduced you to Greg. It is, it is. Um, uh, Brian May was one of our strategic advisors for our organization B612 Foundation. And um, he had been uh, introduced to us by Lord Martin Rees and Peter Gabriel. and. Um, they're friends, uh, 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 Peter Gabriel's friends with Rusty and I, and, and so it was, a, it was a natural fit. We were so excited to have Brian um, join us uh, for B612, uh, for the strategic advisors at B612. Mm -hmm. And Rusty, you were one of the um, co-founders as well of, the, of Asteroid Day. Right. So. Yes, yeah, Stuart, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, I and a number of others were concerned about with this idea, which is primarily public education about asteroids and many of the issues that uh, are contained within the whole concept of protecting the Earth from asteroid impacts. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a natural hazard. It's a cosmic natural hazard, but it's a natural hazard. But it's one that people aren't familiar with at all, uh, aside from a few crazy astronomers and people like us. So one of the big 
problems is that when something like this happens, you can find all kinds of people, some who are very knowledgeable and others who know nothing at all about it, who are waxing eloquent to the public. And they'll tell all kinds of stories. And so one of the, one of the questions, one of the things that we were concerned about was if we're going to do a widespread Asteroid Day thing around the world, we want to make sure that everything that we say is really accurate. And so uh, Danik and I talked about it, and Grig as well, and we ended up forming an Asteroid Day expert panel. And the ADXP uh, was essentially solely responsible for ensuring that everything that w went out on our website and everything that we said was absolutely true because the public has no intuition about, no, no natural experience and intuition of what's right and what's not right. Mm. So that was a very important uh, quality control element that we put into Asteroid Day right from the beginning. Mm. And Darin, you um, have been instrumental uh, in getting the UN to recognize Asteroid Day as well. That's right. The UN is the only international organization uh, uh, which is resolutions and decisions are respected by all countries in the world, by all member states. The UN uh, comprises now uh, 193 states, member states. So when we decided to, to organize uh, the Near Earth Objects uh, Committee within the Association of Space Explorers, led by Rusty at that time, we decided to write a report, a very document, well-documented report about the asteroids and where and how to propose this report to the leaders of the world. The only uh, real possibility was through the United Nations. I, I used to be the chairman of the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, and I made immediately the connection between our association and uh, the COPOS. And then, promoting uh, our study, uh, the asteroid threat, a call for a global response to the UN, it became a working document of the UN. And in the end, uh, three years ago, the UN uh, approved to organize two institutions, the International Advisory Working Network and the Space Mission Advisory, working, uh, Advisory Group. And uh, besides that, there are working groups dealing with the asteroids, but the general population didn't know anything about what we do inside the UN, within the uh, natural organizations. And then this asteroid day came exactly in the right place, in the right time, to be accepted by the UN, promoted by the UN. I made a proposal at the UN on behalf of the Association of Space Explorers, and in less than one year, it became uh, a real, uh, event recognized by the UN and promoted by the UN now at the international level. Perfect. Um, Patrick, very, very quickly, um, this is uh, a, a day that's not just of value to the general public, but also the scientific community as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Asteroid Day is a great opportunity to demonstrate that there are very different communities which are interested in the subject and for very different reasons. And I think the public needs to know that these celestial rocks are not just you know, pieces of rock like this, they contain a lot of information and we can be interested for very different reasons. Well, that's a little bit of the history of Asteroid Day itself. We're gonna go on and hear so much more about asteroids. Um, we may also just possibly um, find one ourselves. And to tell us a bit more about asteroid searching, it's over to jean Luca. So here we are trying to look for asteroids in real time. And for this, of course, we have the best partners in the world. And I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Rose Matheny from the Catalina Sky Survey. It's a big pleasure to welcome her here while she is on the top of the mountain just hunting for near Earth asteroids. So I really want to welcome her here live. Thank you, Gianluca. It's a pleasure for me to be a part of Astro Day and um, in turn for CSS to participate on this great day. Um, as you said, I'm currently on the mountain looking for asteroids. Uh, I'm on, the, on Mount Lemmon using the 1.5 meter telescope. And you can see right behind me, this is the control center. This is where I've been for the past three nights looking for asteroids, and it's been rather productive. Um, joining me on the hunt are my fellow colleagues, Carson Fools, who's just uh, four miles down the road using our 0.7 meter Schmidt telescope, and Richard Kowalski, who's on follow-up duty using the 40-inch telescope remotely from 
the Lunar Planetary Lab at the University of Arizona. Back here, you can see, um, is uh, where I'm actually finding or detecting or validating the images to look for these moving uh, space rocks. And I can show you what I found in the last couple of nights. Sure. Um, sure. How is the weather by, by right now, uh, Rose? Is it clear or not? Are you hunting or not for asteroids right now? <laughs> Right now, my telescope is surveying for those space rocks. Um, and the weather has been actually great the, for my three nights that I've been here. Um, there are thunderstorms lurking in the horizon. By Sunday, it should probably be raining, so the forecast says. We'll see. But right now, the weather has been beautiful. It's clear, and uh, our seeing is rather good. And the only thing is that... Uh, we have the Milky Way right in the center of I the sky, understand. and then we have opposition pretty low. So it makes it uh, a little hard to find those fast-moving objects. But like I said, I have been uh, uh, lucky, and I have found quite a few. So we are really curious to, to see your images. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Let me share with you uh, one image that I found, or one object that I found tonight. Um, and could you see it? Uh, actually, no. OK, let me try that again. This is the good of the live, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> live event. <laughs> all right, let's try this again. Take your time. I know how busy you are up there. After all, you are the highest of this planet to face the asteroid risk on the, at the very first step of this ladder, you know. So it is a pleasure to talk with you while you're doing this. It's a really pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, you still can't see it? Uh, no. <laughs> this that asteroid is... is quite jealous to show, I see. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let me stop sharing that screen and try once more. Please. And then we'll see what happens. Don't worry. This is, you know, this is when we are live, you are. Yes. In any, uh, well, we have no problems, Rose, because you know we have also <laughs> another slot with you later, okay. so we will back to you. And of course, we wish you good luck hunting for new asteroids, and we will stay with you again and learn more from you in 90 minutes, more or less. Thank, thank you. you thank you for hosting us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having us. So I'm here now to talk to uh, ESA astronaut um, Jean-Francois Crevoir. Um, welcome to Asteroid Day. And do please tell us, um, what is it that um, has made you feel this connection to asteroids and the importance of Asteroid Day? Uh, many reasons. Um, you know, the first time I look at the Earth on the night side of the orbit, I saw a very big striking light crossing the field of view. And for many seconds, we were wondering, what is this? And then we realized we were watching a shooting star from above. And we thought we better not be below that shooting star because it was really bright. And when you look at the Earth from space, you can't avoid comparing it to, the spa to a spaceship because it's finite, it's unique, it's beautiful, and it is housing life. And there are many reasons to compare Earth as a spaceship. And asteroids is one more contribution to that comparison because in space, the main threat is from micrometeorites, little rocks going everywhere, and we need to protect. And Earth is a spaceship, and it, has also, it is also subject to threats from space with asteroids. So we, there is this comparison with one difference. In space, we can move our spaceship to avoid, uh, you know, debris or micrometeorites or asteroids. But Earth, we cannot move it. So we better detect asteroids first mm -hmm. and then try to see how we can deflect them. Jean-Francois, thank you. I love the fact that, um, that by calling Earth a spaceship, you've made all of us astronauts. Crew members, not passengers, crew members <laughs> with a responsibility. So now we are going to go over to um, Sabina. Mm. Thank you, Stuart. Yes, Earth as a space vessel. OK, let's actually go out to cyberspace and a Skype call with Victor Barr, who is hosting the Astro Day in Israel. Hi, Victor. Hi, hello, Sabina. This is Victor Barr from Astro Day Israel. Today I am at the beautiful planetarium at the city of Netanya. We just finished a lecture about asteroid, the asteroid threat. 
Yesterday we talked also about the asteroid threat in the in the Givatime Observatory, and later today we will have another event up north at the uh, at Yarka uh, with my friend Maj Tabit. Uh, this year we actually scaled up the asteroid uh, the events. We are here from the beginning, and uh, for the third year we're having th uh, three events. And uh, I can see the public is uh, very, very interested in, the, in these events, and uh, they're asking a lot of questions and uh, coming to the lectures, and it's a, it's a great experience for us all. Thank you, Victor, and thank you for engaging and supporting so much for Asteroid Day. And with that, I think it's time to go over to Natalie and see what's she up to there at Science Center. Natalie, over to you. I'm here again with Guillaume, and we are standing next to an infrared installation. And Guillaume, what have you prepared for us here? Well, this is an installation to demonstrate how one could uh, detect a new asteroid. Um, I have glued here on this uh, wood panel a potato-shaped asteroid made out of wood. And ca can you see it? I can see it, yes, yeah. but not really that well. Yeah, not very that well, because basically it's the same material as the background. And this is exactly what happens with true asteroids. They're basically black, dark as coal, and against the uh, dark background of the sky, they're very difficult to detect with v visible wavelength. And that's where infrared cameras come in? Yeah, yeah, exactly, because since they're black, they absorb a lot of light from the sun and gets pretty hot, say 100 degrees or so. So they emit a lot of infrared, mid-infrared radiation. And I have here in my pocket another one of, this, of these uh, wood asteroids um, that I kept in my pocket for, for quite some time. So it, it is now maybe 35 degrees Celsius or so, so okay. much warmer than, yeah. than the other one. I will stick it close to the first asteroid and in, of course, invisible radiation, you don't see any difference whatsoever. But if you turn to the infrared camera, there you can see this bright infrared dot glowing in the universe. A new asteroid has been found. And that's also the reason why infrared space missions are so important and more and more are being organized? Yeah, you're seeing space missions and then that's important because um, our atmosphere is basically opaque to infrared radiations apart for, for some specific uh, wavelengths. So if you want to detect new stuff in the, in the universe like, like asteroids, you need to go above the, the Earth's atmosphere. And this is what's going, going to happen with the James Webb Telescope. It operates basically in an infrared and in mid-infrared. But you told me to bring also some shades. Look at these. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it, the thing is, the, not only is the, the the atmosphere opaque to asteroids, but plexiglass is also opaque to, uh, to infrared. And so, if you wear these in front, these goggles in front of the in front of the camera, then, well, you you look like a rock star, basically. You see? <laughs> see? I like that. Nice shades, huh? Yeah, great. But but seriously, Guillaume. Uh, there are, there are scientists all over the world right now who are looking, searching for new asteroids. Mm -hmm. Which way exists to detect them? So there are many ways to detect asteroids, but the, the natural way, the most basic way, is to look at the sky with visible wavelengths, even though it's not, it's not optimal, but it works. You just look at a portion of the sky for several nights, and you identify the point sources that you have there. So you'll have background stars that are fixed, and if you're lucky enough, then an asteroid will, will be a, a glowing dot passing by in the foreground. So I hope today that we will find a new asteroid that will be a great present for the anniversary of the Tunguska event. And back to you. Thank you, Natalie. And I'm here. I'm here to welcome uh, Fritz Mäckle. You're, we had uh, Marco, your um, colleague, Fuchs, who was supposed to come, but he got stuck on the plane, and we're a pleasure to have you here. And you're Marco's deputy, and also you handle the business strategy and development at OHB. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask, now OHB, for those of you who don't know, is one of the leading independent forces in, in European space, and is also a very generous sponsor of Asteroid Day, making it possible for us to host this day. So I wanted to hear with you, um, Fritz, why does OHB find Asteroid Day an important incentive 
to support and also what do you hope we can contribute with? Yeah. Um, so OHP, as you said, is one of the main uh, industrial players in space in Europe. We contribute a lot with our programs to security, to communication, mobility, like Galileo navigation, etc. Over many years, we looked into technologies also to observe deep space, to survey uh, space, our surrounding of the Earth. And we see that a big part of our technologies could be really applied for this fascinating field of asteroids. So it's on one hand, uh, the science linked to it, what are asteroids, to explore them more in detail, to protect if required the Earth to look into technologies for this and uh, as well in more long-term future also to see what economic factor is behind asteroid in mining etc. So we see it as an important area of where our technologies could be applied. On the other hand, we also see it's a technology field and we see by supporting this activity also a certain return to the society of what we, uh, let me say, made and learned uh, through programs we do for taxpayers' money to mm. a large extent. Mm. So at this mm. extent, three years later, you're happy with the progress of Astro Day so far? We are very happy with it. We support it. We also thought that Europe would go for a mission already uh, last year by the ministerial ESA ministerial conference. Mm. We hope now with the Asteroid Day and with this type of activities, mm. we can uh, foster and support the awareness in Europe for this very important field, mm. because at the end we may be asked why we haven't done something now mm. to prepare it, because whatever has to be done cannot be done in a few days or weeks or even years. And I want to thank you so much for really contributing and helping us also facilitate that education and raising awareness. And with that, thank you very much, Fritz. You're with welcome. that, I'd mm -hmm. like to welcome our host, Brian Cox, who is now here. And he will host this panel session that will give us insights on research collaboration. So, Brian, welcome and over to you.